I told the people at the salon that I'm a teacher and it's summer. And then every time any new customer came in, the salon owner was like, he's getting his hair dyed blue. That's what teachers do over the summer. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doo. Bloop, doop, da, ba, boo. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's me, Ramon, uh, Mikhail, and Erika. And the three of us are going to be going over video games in 1989. Unfortunately, Molly had a tragic not liking video games disease that um, means she will be unable to attend today. I say this in every one of these videos, but I think this will be a short one. And it never is, but I think this one actually will be, so let's see. The Sega Genesis was released in the US. Now this is this was known as the Sega Mega Drive outside of North America, and it was released uh, in 1988 in Japan, but we got it a year later. This is a 16-bit console, so Nintendo had some competition with their 8-bit console. I never owned a Sega of any type growing up. The only Sega games I played were occasionally at a friend's house, or the few games that I've played on the Switch Virtual Console. I did not own one, but my friend Scott did, and that was basically the focal point of going to his house growing up. It had some good games. Yeah, same thing for me. My cousin had one, and uh, when we moved to be near his neighborhood and we're hanging out with him a lot, I got to play the Sega Genesis several years after it came out, but it was a lot of Sonic the Hedgehog. I think it's actually kind of notable that even compared to the Super Nintendo, which is not out yet, Sega games actually do kind of look better. The graphics are a little bit cleaner, the colors are a little bit brighter, but in general, most of the games that I wanted to play, especially at this time in, in this generation of consoles, were on the Super Nintendo. The Sega had a lot of shoot 'em ups it had a lot of scrolling brawler games, it had uh, a lot of platformers, and a lot of those games were not what I was the most interested in, but they're still good games. Also in 1989, the TurboGrafx-16 released in the US. This was known as the PC Engine uh, outside of North America, and it was released in 1987 in Japan, so they had it for two years. And this was really the main uh, competition for the Super Nintendo. The PC Engine did way better in Japan than the Mega Drive did. When it was released in the US, it was called the TurboGrafx-16, and they put the 16 in the title to sort of trick people into thinking it was a 16-bit console. It wasn't really, but it used some of the same processing elements that other 16-bit consoles do. I'm not mad TurboGrafx, just disappointed. That's Is it bad that I've never heard of any of those systems at all? No, that's not bad. That's just karma, because they lied to the American people about their <laughs> biddage, and as such, they deserve to be forgotten. The three of us have a much better memory of the console wars between Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, and then later with later Nintendo consoles, PlayStation and Xbox. Those are the ones that I feel like the three of us know the best. There were a lot of other consoles, like Atari consoles, and you know the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine and so on that were a thing for a while, but like were not as big as the top two or three. So unless you were like a hardcore gamer or you lived outside of the US, you didn't have as much bandwidth for these other consoles. In retrospect, it seems to me very similar to the debate between Androids and, and Mac products today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty similar. You pick the one that has the things that you want the most. <laughs> and designate it the clearly superior machine. Right, yeah, and, and you will die on that hill. I never had a Game Boy, I had a Game Boy Color, but I had a lot of friends with a Game Boy, and I just remember being wowed by the notion that I could play video games anywhere I wanted, <laughs> which I feel now, in hindsight, is perhaps one of those technological powers that we should not have unleashed to the masses. I don't know. Um, I mean, I say that and, you know, I am currently sitting at a table with both my Nintendo DS and my Nintendo Switch on that table. At the same time as the Game Boy, we had the Sega Game Gear and a couple other things. Maybe not in 1989, but these things were competitors. And really among them, the Game Boy was the least powerful one, but it had that Nintendo library. 
and it had a better battery life than most of the others. And it was certainly the first big commercial success with all the handheld games. So I know this is uh, a few years ahead, but since we did bring it up, I do have my original Game Boy Color. This nice. this was my baby for a long time. I had the original Game Boy and I loved it and I think it just died on me, but I got a good eight or nine years with that sucker before he, before he gave out, but I still have my Game Boy Color here. Now that we're done talking about the Game Boy itself, let's go into some specific Game Boy games. So Super Mario Land was the next iteration of the Super Mario franchise that came out for Game Boy. It had really impressive graphics and I remember really that was sort of my basis for wanting the Game Boy at all. So I think it was a big selling point for them. It did have Princess Daisy coming in, I think for the first time, I think she made her debut in, in this game. So there were a lot of interesting gameplay elements for this one for the for that brought people to the Game Boy. Yeah, I actually want to talk about Princess Daisy for a minute. I don't know a ton about her because I never had Super Mario Land. And the only games that I ever played that had Princess Daisy in them were the thing, like, I never owned Mario Tennis, but things like Mario Tennis, where she was, you know, Peach's couple's partner. So she's the princess of another land, and she's never really played to be a love interest for Mario, which also at this time, Peach wasn't either yet. Is Princess Daisy like the tomboy princess? Because in at least in later, in more recent games, she's like almost like a Punky Brewster type princess. Every time I always saw Daisy, uh, she was introduced as sort of a counterpart to Peach the same way that Luigi was a counterpart to Mario. Certainly not as involved in the storyline, but there to give some more equal representation, I think, to women and to attract more girls to the games. And Daisy was always in a, in a long yellow gown, like uh, similar to Peach's pink gown. So I think she was just there as like a different colored counterpart. That was sort of my thought on, in Daisy's earliest appearances, but like right now I'm playing Super Mario Run again on my phone. I unlocked Daisy as a playable character and she's like, all right! Like, she's like, let's do the thing! And when Peach is still like, yay, Peach! In the way the voice actors portray the roles, they're very different. <laughs> Tetris was released on basically every console imaginable. Like if you could, if you, I'm surprised you couldn't play your Tetris on your microwave uh, at that point. I think Tetris on the Game Boy is sort of significant because some people even called the Game Boy the Tetris machine. Tetris is such a simple and satisfying game, such a simple game to have on the go, to play for only two minutes or to play on a flight, you know? To me, Tetris is a game for people who don't like games. I don't mean you're not a gamer if you like Tetris. It's not what I'm saying. You are still a gamer. You're still just as important as everybody else. But- We, we use inclusive language here, not exclusive language. That's right. <laughs> but um, I think going along with what you're saying here, Tetris is a pretty simple premise. You don't need to sit through, you know, hours of tutorials or backstory exposition in order to understand, put the block into place that don't make all the blocks go up. Really, if you think about it, there's a whole genre of games that Tetris later would influence, games like uh, Bejeweled or uh, Candy Crush. Maybe the mechanics are are noticeably different, like in Bejeweled and Candy Crush, for example, you're matching, you're not just fitting into space, but that whole falling down in a box game thing uh, is easily marketable because you don't need to invest a lot of time in it in the way that you maybe would have to for like a Final Fantasy game or Skyrim or, uh, you know, other games where there's a whole lot of of background information that you need to really be successful. You have side-scrolling games like Mario and Sonic that need a certain amount of coordination, and you have the RPGs like you were just talking about. But with Tetris and other puzzle games, somebody could just come and, and, and sit down right to it. There are epic stories in my family of a family reunion where my cousin brought his Nintendo, and within five minutes, 
all of the dads in our family were were playing Tetris and they were literally hooked for the whole week of this big family reunion. And my family later got a Nintendo for that reason. So I sort of owe my gaming childhood to Tetris because we would have never had that in our house if my dad hadn't gotten hooked on Tetris and wanted to be able to play. That's how easy this thing is because my dad's not a gamer. The Tetris soundtrack, it's wildly popular. It's also wildly underrated among gamers because I think most people put the TV on mute when they were playing Tetris or turned the sound off and you really should go back and listen to the soundtrack of these different boards because it gets played at video game symphony concerts all the time because people love these themes from the original Tetris so go back and listen if you haven't before. Part of what makes it so good is that is it is an existing Russian folk song but I think that's to the game's credit that they could include something like that I think it, it's it's excellent piece of music. It's culture. <laughs> yeah. Never really a, a, a franchise that excited me all that much, so I never was too invested in finding out the others. I've heard that like multiplayer Bomberman games are some of the most fun you can have, because uh, it's just like hectic and bombs exploding everywhere and people running around a grid. Erica and I each have played a little bit of it. Star Soldier is a shooter, like a space shooter type thing. You're a spaceship, you shoot the, the things. This one was kind of frustrating, but partially for me because I suck at these type of games. But uh, this one has actually really great music. I tend to do a little better with, with some of the space shooter games, but I also, my patience to sit and play them for long periods of time and get really good at them has waned in recent years. So I think that with a little time, it would have been a lot more fun to to see like, ooh, this is what that does. And, you know, that's true of most video games. But this one didn't strike me as something that would really draw me back as often because the graphics were, I mean, I'm sure they were great for their time, but there was there wasn't much of a hook visually to like really get me into it. I did like how this game has things that you fly up above and fly under, which I'm not used to seeing, but it also ended up being sort of a frustrating thing, at least playing on the Switch, which playing any NES or SNES game on the Switch is already kind of frustrating because it's not the same button layout. But I think a lot of it is what you were saying, Erica, is just we don't have the patience for this anymore. My brother and I owned on NES. I think I maybe played once on NES, and I have not played it on Switch because I don't care about football games. Marble Madness came out in 1989. I had it on NES, and I remember really liking it, but it's not on Switch, but it is on the NES Classic. I found it way more frustrating than I remember when playing it on the NES Classic. It's an isometric puzzle game where you're playing, you're controlling a marble rolling around, and you have to get to the goal and not fall off and not crack into things. But it's way touchier than I remember. But again, I think that's also sort of the same idea. I don't have the patience for it that I used to. Oh, I liked that one. I thought it was fun. I liked the Buddhist temple and how you see Buddhists fighting each other, which just never happens. Uh, the only thing that confused me was just the hitbox was a little confusing of, of which way to hit everybody. And I think part of that was the enemies that you had to come at them different enemies from different directions. Some were from the side, some were underneath that you had to hit them, so. But it was, I, I enjoyed it. That was one I might pick up again. So for this game, you're just playing a Kung Fu practitioner and you are dropped into an arena, basically, and these enemies show up and you have to kill X number before the door to the next level shows up. I found it really frustrating and slow moving and the hitboxes were really frustrating to me. I do not love this game, but Erica loves it, so. If you're into this sort of game, give it a shot. You might like it way more than I do. <laughs> this game is so heckin' hard, but the world of this game is so interesting. The sort of comic book-esque cutscenes in between levels are really cool. The story's dark and dramatic, and I, uh, when I was writing my notes on it, I wrote Ninja Noir, and that's basically what it is. It's basically a noir story with ninjas. The music's excellent. It feels good to play, even though it's really frustrating with like that one bird or bat that will fly in and knock you off the level and kill you instantly. So you get used to the game over music pretty quickly, at least if you're me when you're playing this game. It's a puzzle game and it's got cute music, but I, Erica and I were both getting very frustrated with it. <laughs> I love this game, I grew up on it. It's a very difficult game, 
but I love that the damn level is now a meme about difficulty in video games. Like, you've got your Dark Souls and you've got your damn level in, in the first Ninja Turtles game. Basically, you, you choose from the turtles and you go about platforming, but there's also an overworld map where you do some fighting. And your turtles don't die. They get kidnapped by the enemies and held prisoner at the dam. So if you're good enough, you can get extra lives by rescuing the turtles who have who have died. But there's also this coral that is electric that you have to like very delicately swim between, and it's incredibly difficult. I have a lot of fun memories of trying to force my way through this game because I loved the turtles so much when I was this age. I can hear the sound effect for when you run into the coral while you're swimming, and it's haunting me. I played for about 10 minutes and Erica watched me. I couldn't even really figure out the controls completely. Kind of not fun, partially because I didn't know what I was doing. Later editions of it call it Earthbound Beginnings. So it's, it's a good game. I've been playing a little bit of it on Switch. I have yet to recruit the second kid, but I've met him and I'm about to do the quest to recruit him. It even has a lot of the same music as Earthbound, like a lot of these same tracks were like redone for Earthbound, but I would not recommend this game to anyone who doesn't already love Earthbound. If you have not played any of these games yet, play Earthbound first. It does all the same things, but better. Better graphics, better sound, better story. The, the story is light in both games, but it's even more, it's even lighter in Mother. I've never played the original. I've played the other two games. In, it's only the three in the series, right? Yeah, I've played the other two games in the series. Uh, I was just watching a moment or two of gameplay from the original. I'm surprised, first of all, at how similar it looks to Earthbound. Like, other than the graphics being worse, uh, it looks pretty much the same. You're walking around, you get random encounters, and it even includes the fun little, like, flavor text of when things don't go your way in combat, like, insert character name here, was thinking about what they're eating for dinner or something when they miss an attack. And I love that and how it contributes to the whole, like, goofy, charming atmosphere and tone of these games. But, uh, one thing interesting to me about these games is despite that tone and despite how the plot, as you sort of referenced, sometimes feels sparse, these games can get dark. I don't know a whole lot about the plot of the original, but from what I remember reading on a synopsis, it was, I mean, unpleasant things happen. Now, Dragon Quest had been in Japan for a while now, but it was released in the US as Dragon Warrior originally. Uh, my brother and I had this on NES as well. It is way too grindy and I could never get into it. It is currently for, I think, $5 on Switch, and I was, I've been tempted to just check it out again for such a low price, but unless they have made you level up faster and earn money faster, I don't know if I even should bother with it, even for just five bucks. Yeah, I don't think, as much of a hardcore roleplay gamer I am, I don't think I can handle like going back and playing all these old school games the way that you can. I've purchased the remaster of a few too many RPGs that I played as a child. And honestly, most of the time it's been worth the money to rebuy a game I already bought. Cause I'm like, wow, I can speed run through an encounter. And I don't, every encounter doesn't need to take two to five minutes to grind. You know, I don't know how people did it in the Dragon Warrior era. <laughs> like, Well, I, I think a big part of it is that there is considerably so little in the game that making everything take longer and requiring you to level up more makes the game longer. Like if you could just win every battle, it would probably only take you a couple hours to beat it. We also forget how much more time we had on our hands back then. It's like the Game Boy, you know, like my Game Boy fit in my pocket because I didn't have to carry around a wallet and a cell phone and a pair of house keys at the time. So the DuckTales game on NES was was truly brilliant. There was actually a big pull for this one for a very long time for it to be reissued on the Wii and then on the Switch, which it has now finally been. And it's been, the graphics have been upped and it's and it's beautiful. The original game was so much fun and it was, and it was so well based on the 
TV show that we all knew and loved when we were kids and the music was great. And it was a, a pretty straightforward story that could have easily just been an episode of the old cartoon. But the, the graphics were beautiful. I loved, I loved that game. It was one of my favorite blockbuster rentals. It's one of my favorites too. It's a classic. And yeah, as you were saying, it's one of the best soundtracks on the NES. Uh, shout out to composer Hiroshige Tonomura. Um, really, really excellent work. Um, and the moon theme especially is so good. Love bouncing around on that pogo stick. Okay, well, the last NES game that I wrote on uh, our doc here that came out in 1989 is Tetris, and we've already talked plenty, so let's move on. It's a space shooter like all the others, except it is you're going in four directions. From what I've been able to play far enough to see, there's no physical location end goal. You're just flying around on a map and shooting things and not dying. It's kind of fun, but it's it's not for me. That one, that was another one that I would pick up again and play with it. I, even more than the other shooter game we were talking about, I, I, I felt like that was a little more intriguing. And I'm like, ooh, where's this thing going? But you're right, it really was just survive as long as you can. Yeah, but I, I, I agree. I think this game is more interesting than the other one, Star Soldier, though it was an NES game. It's a pretty standard beat-em-up side-scrolling beat-em-up, a coin munching side-scrolling beat-em-up. It's difficult. You're supposed to die a lot, so you put in more coins so you can keep playing. But I think the most interesting part of this game is that the power-ups first make you muscular and then turn you into various animals. And it's basically, it's a wonder I'm not a furry. It's part RPG, part Zelda-like top-down top -down adventure game, and part dungeon crawler. Basically, all of the towns are basic are an RPG town, and you level up like an RPG, and you talk to townspeople and buy equipment and items and things like that, and rest at the inn. But when you're walking the world map, it is a first-person dungeon crawler. You take a step forward, and then maybe an enemy shows up, or you or you turn a corner, and there might be a chest there. Same thing when you're actually in a cave or a dungeon or anything like that. But then when you get into a battle, it turns into basically a Zelda-like game. You're dropped into a little arena and there are a bunch of enemies wandering around and you have to just fight them like in a Zelda game. It doesn't play as well as a Zelda game. It's sort of like Kung Fu Heroes, the hitboxes are sort of difficult to figure out where they are. And you do have to kind of grind a lot to not die at every battle. But it's a really interesting game. I don't know if I think it's fun, but it's a really interesting concept for a game. Again, a typical quarter munching game. It's difficult, they want you to die a lot, so you have to put in more quarters and keep playing. I think this one is a little bit too hard for me personally to casually play and have fun with it. it it's a fun game. Okay, well that's everything that I had on the list. Stay fresh, cheese bags, and <laughs> I'll talk to you all soon. We'll hope, hope you enjoy this video. Let us know if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, Anything you're looking forward to from video games in 1990, which we'll get to at some point. And um, yeah, give this video a like, give us a follow, and maintain your groovy selves. See y'all soon.